Okay, welcome, welcome back for the poetry reading portion. Um, we'll start right on time, more or less. Um, no technology beyond this. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Joshua, for coming from California on your way to Poland and Boston and stopping here in Kenosha, where he reminded us of uh, its presence in Gravity's Rainbow, which was exciting to remember. The Kenosha Kid is a song in Thomas Pynchon's novel, Gravity's Rainbow, so give you all another reason to go read that book. Um, well, a couple of things about Joshua. Um, <laughs> I called him, in the little press release I wrote, an important and unusual figure in American letters, um, which was not a reference to his height, but to his uh, extraordinary breadth and depth of interest in, in lots of important things. Um, he's a poet of radical liveliness, a cultural theorist and historian, a music and culture critic currently at The Nation, where you can read his take on TV shows. It seems like a lot of TV, mostly TV, TV, music, uh, and so on. He wrote in the past for Village, The Village Voice and Spin Magazine. He's also a participant and leader in radical politics and protest um, in California with the Occupy movements and the Oakland Commune, and then also uh, in contact with uh, people involved in radical politics uh, all across the world. A conference was organized by Joshua and uh, several others um, on revolution and or poetry, organized with Christopher Chen and Juliana Spar. Um, and so he's at this sort of ne nexus of, uh, of poetry and a, a sort of new, a new relation of poetry and politics in this particular moment and the way it's expressing itself. And that's a little bit of what we've gotten to hear today. So earlier, a talk that uh, sort of started, centered on riots and strikes and had poetry coming in, in in a related way and now poetry. And you can see how the two will come together in the end. Um, Judith Butler said of his book, The Totality for Kids, which was also praised in Entertainment Weekly, uh, to show the full range. <laughs> There's no greater range, I think, in, our, in American uh, letters than that. Um, she said, we encounter here an enormous clarity of language in the service of a poetics that brilliantly queries our historical moment in and as form. Uh, and I think that's something that continues in Red Epic and really takes as a central question uh, poetry in its form as relation, in relation to our moment in time. Um, in the spring, look for Riot Strike Riot uh, from Verso Press, a great press if you're interested in the kind of political questions that were raised earlier in the day. If you want lots of books there that will help you investigate those questions and Riot Strike Riot will examine the return of the riot and how it testifies to current possibilities of anti-capitalist struggle. Um, today, poetry. And I'm so grateful to have Joshua here for his energy, his warmth, his humor, and his anger uh, that he told me a long, long ago is to be cherished and not something to try to escape. Uh, if the contemporary situation makes you feel that way. Uh, and I'm, I'm grateful for that, and I'm looking forward to hearing some poems. Please welcome Joshua Clover. That was so kind. I'm a little abashed, but I, I really appreciate it. And I said it earlier, and I'll, I'll say it again. Like, um, I just feel lucky every time I get to see Rick, and I trust you all know you're lucky to, to have, have him around. and, and um, and he's, I'm sure he's lucky to have, have you as well. And I'm, I'm grateful to be here with you this evening. I'm going to start over at the podium. I have one poem over there. So come with. it's on my computer. It's not by me. Um, I wanted to read one poem by uh, probably the poet who's been the most persistent for me in the last couple of years, although it's not new work. Uh, a poet named Diane de Prima. Uh, uh, wrote a book over the course of several years, probably about seven years maybe, called Revolutionary Letters. Uh, and it's a series of poems. Each one's called Revolutionary Letter and a Number. And I'm going to read Revolutionary Letter number nine. Advocating the overthrow of government is a crime. Overthrowing it is something else altogether. 
It is sometimes called revolution, but don't kid yourself. Government is not where it's at. It's only a good place to start. One, kill the head of Dow Chemical. Two, destroy plant. Three, make it unprofitable for them to build again, i.e., destroy the concept of money as we know it, get rid of interest, savings, inheritance, or let's start with no money at all and invent it if we need it, or mimeograph it and everyone print as much as they want and see what happens. Declare a moratorium on debt. The Continental Congress did on all debts, public and private. No one owns the land. It can be held for use. No person holding more than they can work themselves and family working, let no one work for another except for love. And what you make above your needs to be given to the tribe, a commonwealth. None of us knows the answers. Think about these things. The day will come when we will have to know the answers. Okay, how, how's this for volume? I, we had a problem with the volume before. Is there, it's okay? You can hear me in the back. Uh, I actually rarely read from, from older books, but uh, I wrote this book, The Totality for Kids, came out a few years ago, and I wrote parts of it um, while hanging out with Rick in Paris. Um, and, I, and so I was sort of in memory of that, I wanted to read just a poem from it, and then a part that's not a poem, for, for reasons that are annoying, my own doing, I wanted to annoy people, uh, there's an index in the, in the back. I could tell you why, but it's really not important. All, there's an index, and I didn't, I want to show you I didn't do it, I actually hired a professional indexer, Andrew Joran, who's a great poet too, if you ever encounter his work, Andy Joran, uh, but he makes a living doing copy editing and indexing. And I had some money from my press, and I figured out a way to get it to Andy, um, who needed the money, and he made me this index, and I just thought I would read, as one does, uh, a small bit of the index. Malievich, Kazimir, 1731-48-60. Mallarmé, Stefan, 52-54. Matze Tung, 57. Maps, 2053. Murray District, 4. Marker, comma, Chris, 52. Marx, comma, Karl, on commodity fetishism, 14, on having nothing, 54. Melancholy, 6, 8, 54, 56, 67. Midas, daughter of, 3, mind compared to, 4, money, colon, bags of, 62, 63. Candy colored, 15. See also, light, money colored. And cinematic narrative, 29, drowning in, 16, gracefully leaping, 66, lack of, 19, moving stream of, 26, train bearing, 65. Monumentality, 37, 44, 56. Moon, clattering gears of, 67, gloom associated with, 32, half, 9. Mr. X, parentheses, comic book, 12, murder, 21, 34, museums, 4, 5, 28, 50, 57, music, 3, 4, 5, disappointment with, 58, diversity of, 68, as invention of flowers, 59, mysticism, 47, 66, mythomania, 4, 22, Neelan, comma, Chris, 6, necropolis, 37, 42, negri, comma, Antonio, 57, New York, 52 to 57, 1900, comma, 14, 1953, 15, 1968, 4, 12, Nirvana, 23, O'Hara, comma, Frank, 64, Orpheus, 20, Outcast, 56, Oxycontin, 7. Give you a sense of the range of my interests. The, the first time I ever went to Paris, 
seem to be a lot of Paris. I lived in Paris for, for a while, so a couple different times. It's inevitable. It can't, it can't be avoided in the poems, alas. The first time I went to Paris, the night before I left, I did a poetry reading in Berkeley, which is my sort of hometown, with another poet who I won't name, because I hate him. And, um, <laughs> and uh, at the dinner after the reading, that's how it works. You have a reading when you have a dinner and you talk to the other poet and you secretly hate each other. And I was telling him I was going to Paris the next day I'd never been. I was sort of excited. I'm like a rube. I'm like, Paris. And he's like, yeah, don't write any Paris poems. Um, so I, I decided to take his advice. I, I wrote this poem instead. It's called Peoria. Peoria with your unshaven boys smooching on street corners or talking on the phone while skating headlong into tourists who throng the ghosty avenues of Peoria, with your grand soirees and jubilations pushing out against the weight of history, Peoria, capital of the 19th century, with your cloud of excess signs and gold leaf settling on the eyelids of black-haired women glowing from the terrace cafes which line the stone banks of Kickapoo Creek, flowing like blue milk under the bridges of Peoria and your swank manners and red suburbs and no future and movies where strangers swap philosophical gems and fall at once into bed. Never have so few of all possible kisses involved me as in Peoria, Midwestern city of lights. And so off to glamorous Vernon, city of canals, five-step bridges with arcane graffiti with its three million atavistic pigeons at the heart of a jewel box labyrinth and its ancient library drooping languorously into the lagoon a few inches per annum bearing Tom Swift down to the doges. Vernon with its dead ends and no vistas and supermodels in their sunglasses and autumn exile like the four figures in the mystical marriage of Saint Catherine attributed to Parmigianino seemingly torn from a glossy and glued to the abyss. Oh, everywhere at once, I must be with you. I'm going to read some poems from this new book. Four short ones and one longer one. This book was written um, between about 2008 and 2014. So it starts with, it, it more or less starts with the, huge, the global financial crisis of 2008 and the experience of living through that in a series of political mobilizations in the, in the Bay Area and, and other places. And so there'd be these mobilizations and then there'd be massive repression and people would end up in, in jail and everyone would sort of be terrified and angry and, and retreat from, from politics and have, well, the way I narrate it is, is, is uh, era of helicopters, police helicopters came a lot, era of helicopters, era of reading groups, era of helicopters, era of reading groups. There was like a, a full cycle of areas where you'd sort of go out and then retreat. And this book sort of tries to follow through that sequence in various ways. Uh, um, that's just, I, I, don't, I don't think that explains much, it's just sort of context for the, the, the book. The first poem is called My Life in the New Millennium. It was true that the more I hated people, the more I loved cats. Then people started to surprise me. Often this involved fire or Coca-Cola bottles with petrol, which amounts to the same thing. Once fire is the form of the spectacle, the problem becomes how to set fire to fire. Some friends were prepared to help with this, which Michael Jackson having died and then Whitney Houston was the new pop music. Without an underlying understanding of the world system and the truth of land as the place of politics and the sea as the space of commerce, it is hard to integrate that other most important fact of our era pirates, my friends and pirates and cats. It comes down to comrades known and elsewhere. I'm not reading that poem. 
terrible idea. Hmm. Oh, I'll read that poem. Galactic. I've never read this poem or reading before, but we were, we were talking about it before, so I figured I'd give it a... I don't know, I don't know how to read it. We'll, we'll find out. And the neighbors are playing a recorded muezzin in the courtyard, and the people upstairs are having a party and laughing out the window, and the women are arriving in sparkly silver shoes, and the style, I'm told yesterday in London, is called galactic. And it was over last month, says Bimya, tan and beautiful with Romanche accent, and I'm feeling very global about all of this, and we talk Borges translations, and I catch up on the latest fashions, and is that not paradise? And home again the next day, I run into Damon and Naomi in the street, stopping en route to a wedding in Morocco. It doesn't even feel coincidental. We discuss Japanese noise bands, and later I go to the leftist bar with Weefy near the bookstore and the blue clouds, and is that not paradise? And thinking is a feeling too, but one that cannot come to rest in another. And I am in love with everybody, which is miserable and lasts five minutes amidst this great muchness of things. I go down to the noodle shop to act out scenes from a Wong Kar Wai movie in my head about the sweet-faced counterman who probably has no idea, though he gives me some knowing looks, and we were waiting together in the noodle steam and in the tamarind and lemongrass steam for an international letter with a key folded inside or for love to return, and in walks a sexy boy with scarred lip and we are the power t-shirt, and he is tremendously real just as abstract ideas are real, and the absence of beloveds is real, and the incomparable Fei Wong, having of late moved to Beijing from the real world of the movies, is still exactly as real as the steam in the noodle shop is real, and how is this not paradise? If love is for one, if love is a redoubt against the many, it is useless to me. It is some holiday, and my friends are scattered like confetti on the earth. This is a longer poem. It's actually sort of a, a three-section sequence. I feel like there's some things I should explain before I read it, but I'm not sure what those things are. Uh, maybe I'll just tell the story of my friend to whom the second part is, is, is dedicated. There was one of those, this is sort of in the earlier days of Facebook, this must have been 2009, way back in 2009, where there was this thing to do where you would, it was like list 25 things that no one knows about you. I mean, you just list, you remember this? Yeah, I thought it was tawdry. But, um, but it turned out to be fascinating. I never did it because I'm, I'm not a joiner. I'm like, oh, everyone's doing that. I can't. I, I. But, and they circulated, and they were all like slightly interesting and slightly annoying in that way that, that those things are. And then one day I saw a friend of mine who so I hadn't, hadn't seen in a couple of years, and you know, she lived in Massachusetts, and you know, sort of lose track of people. But Facebook floated across, and there was the 25 things, each one of which was like more annoying and banal than the last one, until I got to, it got to the very last one, which was, um, I believe there will be a revolution in my lifetime, and that's the only reason I'm not afraid of dying. And I read that sentence, and I thought, that is the thought that I've been carrying in my head my entire life without ever formulating into words. Right? You have that, ever had that experience where like, the thing you didn't know, you thought every second of your life suddenly appeared before you, and it was utterly overwhelming. And uh, the second section of this poem, a part called Transistor, is uh, in, in memory of that moment. The first section is, uh, is called Red Epic. Mediators, matadors, how trivial and objective this world is. Semiologists, stevedores, how objective and trivial. Equally fucked we are. Well, not 
equally. I have an MCM aesthetic and a radio-controlled death drive. There are two parties to every romance, the waged and the wager. And it has been getting harder to decipher the difference. A throw of the dice will never reveal the real subject, oh, mediator, stevedores, etc. Madrid is sometimes in flames, though confusingly, the Spanish stairs are in Rome, which is often in flames. Oakland is sometimes pleasingly in flames. Athens is almost always a flame. Also Thessaloniki. Big data murmurs to me the likelihood that at a given profit rate in a given sector, a given household debt, a given wage deflation, a given neighborhood would be in flames. Given fire is the unfettered substance of the situation. To begin again from the beginning, to write only for one's friends. Two lovers make a zero. Two speculations make a hedge. If tender buttons had been written by capital, instead of objects, food, rooms, it would have a single section called labor power. Though technical language is not conducive to enlisting popular support, if lunch poems were the poetry of the future, it would be all like, I communize this, I communize that. Transistor. There will be a revolution or there will not. If the latter, these poems were nothing but entertainments. If the former, it will succeed or fail. If the latter, these poems were better than nothing. If the former, it will feature riots, fire, and looting. And these will spread or they will not. If the latter, these poems were curiosities. If the former, it will feature further riots, manifestos, barricades, and slogans. And these will leap into popular song, or they will not. If the latter, that's that. If the former, these popular songs will be overcome, or they will not. If the latter, these poems were no different than the songs. If the former, the popular itself will be abolished via riots, barricades, manifestos, occupations, and fire, or it will not. If the latter, we will spend several more decades talking about culture. If the former, the revolution will at this point be destroyed from within or without. If the latter, these poems went down fighting. If the former, it will feature awful confrontations with former friends, and there will be further manifestos, new slogans, ongoing occupations, and communes, and lovers will be enemies. We do not know what will happen after this point, but surely this is enough to draw some preliminary conclusions. The poem must be on the side of riots, looting, barricades, occupations, manifestos, commune slogans, fire, and enemies. The last part is called Poem Ending with a Line from Lorene Niedeker. I keep my mind under my arm where I hold my head when I walk down to market, when I walk, when I walk down to the market, the actions are social, but the mind is private. When I walk down, walk down to the inferno, the mind is private. I had a vision, the mind is privately held under my arm. When I walk, I had a dream, had a Baudelaire, had a Rambo, the action is social, but Apollinaire walks down, he promenades down to market, promenades in the market, walks out, walks home, walks through streets named after market towns. The names are social, but the century is private. The inferno is social, but the mind follows the head, thinks we can leave, thinks we can go down to the market and leave, just leave, thinks we can be in it, but not of it. You know all too well that the best poetry is not the least revolution. You also know that poetry is the best way available to you to affirm this truth. Now we start to see how the trap is sprung, how it was sprung and all before you were born, mind under your arm in the poetry market that exists 
despite the spontaneous wailings of the poets who believe there must be no market because they cannot afford that for which they should not have to pay. The action is social, but the market exists as the secret police exists. Alas, the market will never send you to jail for your poems, though we all believed in private that we were worth jailing for the terrible sedition of our dithyrams, believe we deserve this honor in a no passeron, toto somos pussy riot sort of way, yet the good reader geared for riot, zip ties dangling, cometh not for us. The world of the poem is the world. The world is abstract and real. The poem fails just when it is victorious because one cannot live the absolute of victory over the sun until one can, and we do, and many will die when this happens. Poetry will be renewed in the blood of the negative and dreadfully much else. I always had this fantasy. I periodically give. Well, yeah, if, if you were here early this afternoon, you sort of saw a version of like the conference talk where you give a give a paper and present your materials. I always had this fantasy that you sort of fake your way through the whole thing because writing them takes a lot of time and a lot of research, and moreover, it's very anxiety-producing. And that you could sort of, at some point, just have like a stack of papers and stand up there and sort of shuffle them around and say, like, you know, well, as I've argued elsewhere, sort of pause and shuffle them around and say, like. So I think you can see where that's going and shuffled. So just like all the, like the fill, it was not, none of the actual thinking, just the sort of side material and you could at some point in your life you just fake it through with all of that. That's sort of my great dream. So it turns out that that particular kind of speech has a name which is metalipsis, right? It's talking around uh, something. And this is a, a poem I wrote for um, a friend of mine named Wien Hua, who's a wonderful poet. has a great book of poetry called ASL, um, Age, Sex, Location, which is, I think, actually hard to find in the world. I think it sold all the copies that exist, but it's a great book. Anyway, a metalipsis for Wien Hua. As I have argued elsewhere, most people are Rihanna, and the rest are Donald Sutherland, or maybe Michael Caine, which everyone was in Alfie. I don't mean this typologically, like there are two kinds of people. There are two people in the world, and they share certain things but have never met, and we are them. All of us are them. This is okay. In fact, I would give my left eye to be the beautiful boy who was in Alfie, but I'm not. I'm Rihanna. This is my flag of convenience when I am walking with headphones on through the theory district. Uh, this is the last poem I'm going to read from this book, and I'm going to read one brand new poem, and then we shall go out into the evening and break things. Is this a poem called Hyxaity? It's a f fake word. No, it's a, it's a real word, but not in English. English, I wouldn't use a Latin word if, if there was any choice. English doesn't really have the word. It usually gets translated as thisness, like the particularity of, of, of something's own being. Thisness, I don't know. Hyxaity. If what you want is calm to be restored, you are still the enemy. You have not thought through clearly what that means. If what you want is a national moment of silence, the indictment of a single police officer, or two, or three, you are still the enemy. You have chosen the reverie of law for you and your friends. If you want another review panel, a Justice Department study, a return to democracy, 
rather than for riot and looting to leap beyond itself from county to county, rift to rift, until it becomes general. You have not understood what a revolution is. It's just this. It's coming out again night after night. More of us than there are of them. It's saying no to every deal. Remember, nothing belongs to you because nothing belongs to anyone. poem has rhymes in it. That's the first bit of bad news. The second bit is it has the most annoying first line in the history of poetry. I, I believe, I, I haven't read all poems, this is like guesswork in certain ways, but I feel proud of myself for how annoying the first line is. It also narrates a bunch of shit that happened in the poetry community over the last year that if you're not sort of stuck in the game, might, might not have been something you come to know about or register. Multiple poets uh, did a bunch of stuff that was really like uh, racist. Um, one of them, I'll just narrate quickly so you have some context for the poem. There's a poet whose name I won't mention because I hate him, um, <laughs> uh, who works in a genre of like appropriation poetry where he, he will reprint and read just text he's found elsewhere. So he has a book that's the entirety of one day of the New York Times typed, typed into a book. It's quite long. Um, and like that. So it's like, you know, copy art, appropriation art, uh, which is, you know, the thing. It's a boring thing. And, uh, but fine. People, people, you know, go on with their lives. And, um, uh, Earlier this year at a conference, festival, whatever it was, he decided his appropriation art would be just to read the autopsy report for Michael Brown, the uh, young person who was killed in, in Ferguson, Missouri. And that really did not work out for him. <laughs> um, people were pretty horrified. There was vague attempts to defend it. Uh, but it was, it, was pretty ho it was pretty offensive. Uh, in fact, he'd moreover, he didn't read it exactly as written. He changed it a little bit and changed the order. So he ended on an image of my dead Michael Brown's penis, his genitals, which really also added to people's upset. And it's kind of, it's kind of fucked up his career, which is OK with me. <laughs> um, and, that, there was, and there was some other, so there was some other fucked up stuff in the poetry world, too, probably more than I could imagine. Uh, but some of that makes it into this, this poem. Okay, that's a whole lot of narrative for a rhyming poem. <laughs> There's only a couple. Every, every stanza ends in a little couplet. It's called The Two Deaths. As Hegel remarks somewhere, <laughs> it's terrible, right? <laughs> I'm going to start again. As Hegel remarks somewhere, it's probably the best way to begin a poem. Though there is something to be said for Elisa Lamb was high as fuck in that video, or the invocation of an absent friend, Cian, my contemporary, my time comrade, are you OK? Are you reading philosophy in Berlin? Are you a free man in Paris? I miss you tragically. But I would leave here, too, if I could. Poetry is not a force for good. Poetry is not a force for good. Poems are the TLDR of survival, or a forcing house for feelings we were going to have anyway, but too early or too late. And meanwhile, Wendy's subway and the body of Michael Brown and coon song revivals cannot just be detached from the social life of poetry. Thus, an impasse as with desires that have failed and still cannot be amended. Society must be defriended. Society must be defriended with its two deaths. The first where everyone in the underworld must mourn 
and the second where no one in the city is allowed to mourn or even bury the body. Call it white death and black death as a total system or maybe Thebes is just work, waged work, abject work, informal selling of Lucy's on the corner and we are forbidden from saying that this is hell while alive, but it leaks into the songs. There's a darkness at the edge of tone. There's a darkness at the edge of tone, or what is beautiful about English is that all its speakers will one day be dead, and nobody will mourn them. For the last speakers will be every bit as terrible as we are, as small-minded and hateful with our feuding and fucking and making each other dinner. Okay, that doesn't seem so awful, but the last poem is already written. It is already written but not for us, written not for this world, the first poem in the last person plural. Thank you very much, I appreciate your coming.